Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving the over 100,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM members. I'm Marty Hurst. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley. My primary research interests are user interfaces for search engines, information visualization, natural language processing, and improving MOOCs. I'm a fellow of the ACM and a member of the steering committee for the 2015 ACM Learning at Scale Conference, having served as a program chair in 2014. You can find my full bio at the presenter window of your console. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM learning resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides timely computing information published by ACM, including communications of the ACM and Q magazines, access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, and international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Emphasis Foundation Awards. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Before we get started, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. In the top right corner of the slide area on your screen, there is a button that will allow you to enlarge the slides. You may also enlarge the slides at any time by dragging the corner of the slide window. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. During this presentation, you can minimize the slide area, Q&A, and bio screens using the buttons on the bottom panel. You can also use a number of widgets also found in the bottom panel, including Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, and a resource list where you can get a copy of the slides. If you are experiencing problems with our web interface, please refresh your console by pressing the F5 key in Windows, Command plus R if you're on a Mac, refresh your browser if you're on a mobile device, or close and relaunch the presentation. You can also visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the slide window. To control volume, please adjust the master volume on your computer. At the end of our presentation, we will have time for questions, and we hope that you have some to share. If you think of a question during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box and click on the Submit button. You do not need to wait till the end of the presentation to begin submitting questions. You may also use the Q&A box and the survey at the end to suggest topics for future webinars. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey URL on the final slides. Please take a minute to fill out that survey and help us improve our webinars. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when the archive is available, or you can check learning.acm.org in a few days for updates. You can also use the Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag hash ACM webinar MOOC. We'll be watching for your tweets. Today's presentation is The Online Revolution, Education for Everyone by Andrew N. Andrew N. is a co-founder of Coursera and director of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab, where he does research in machine learning. In 2011, he led the development of the Stanford University's main MOOC, Massive Open Online Courses, platform, and also taught an online machine learning class that was offered to over 100,000 students, leading to the founding of Coursera with his partners. Their goal is to give everyone in the world access to a high-quality education for free. Today, their platform partners with top universities to offer high-quality, free online courses. 
With over 100 partners, over 500 courses, and 5 million students, theirs is the largest MOOC platform in the world. Ng's recent awards include being named to the Time 100 list of the most influential people in the world, to the CNN 10 thinkers list, Fortune 40 under 40, and being named by Business, Lead Business Insider as one of the top 10 professors across Stanford University. Andrew, we look forward to your presentation here today. Um, thanks a lot, Madi, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, so some of you will already know a little bit about uh, the Coursera story, um, but what I'd like to do is start by telling you about one of our students, um, Shamin Shahabuddin. So Shamin lives in Bangladesh, uh, and um, all through her life she has been moved by the plight of poor women in Bangladesh. Um, some of you will know about microcredit loans, the microfinancing, and some of the success stories. But uh, it turns out that in Bangladesh, some number of women are subject to predatory microfinance practices, and they end up taking up loans that they're unable to repay, facing tremendous social pressure to repay loans that they don't have the money to, to, to pay back. And some of the creditors go to the women and tell them, uh, you have to sell your house, you have to sell your children, and some number of these women end up committing suicide as a result. Um, so a few years ago, Shamin met two women in Bangladesh, uh, both of whom were engaged to men whose fiancés were demanding unreasonably large dowries that would have put the women's families in dire financial straits. Shamin failed with one, but succeeded with the other to convince her to run away with Shamin and to build an independent life and to support themselves. So how do you, if, if you're a girl with a, with a runaway in, the Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, what do you do to support yourself? On the suggestion of her sister, she decided to start a bakery. But um, this wasn't easy. First, Shamin had never baked before. Uh, but more so, she um, had very little business knowledge. And, uh, and so in the early days, when she tried to start a bakery, she found that her product had very poor product market fit. Initially, uh, her customers would buy bagels from her, but they expect that bagels should be fluffy and be mad at her for that. Uh, she all had customers that would uh, buy English muffins, savory or salty English muffins from her, but be upset because they were expecting sweet cupcake or American cupcake muffins. Um, <clears throat> but she decided to persevere and to continue building up a bakery, but perhaps more inspiringly, she wanted to grow it into an organization, not just to sell baked goods, but an organization that will support and empower women. So facing these early challenges, what Shamin decided to do was to go onto the internet to try to learn and develop herself and give herself the knowledge to help her build her own operation. Um, she read a lot of things on the internet, but in the course of the internet wondering, she eventually came across courses offered by the University of Pennsylvania by Penn on economics. She decided to take a course from Penn on economics to improve her financial knowledge. And when I spoke with her about three weeks ago, she told me it was a very difficult course, but she persevered. And um, after some number of weeks, she earned her first verified certificate from Penn on um, principles of microeconomics. She decided to continue and next took a course on model thinking from the University of Michigan. Uh, and she didn't stop there. She went on to take another class from the University of Michigan, uh, this time on um, uh, intro to finance. She then went to UC Irvine and took some courses on advanced economics. Uh, went back to Penn or Wharton to take some classes on financial accounting, on um, uh, 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 business, and finally on marketing. And using the knowledge that she has gained from these MOOCs, she has grown her bakery substantially. In her first month, Shamin had her one runaway girl employee, this one that she convinced to run away from her fiance, and the two women had brought in $900, 900 US dollars in the first month, which isn't quite enough for two women to live on. Uh, in the most recent month, when I spoke with her, she had grown her revenue, she had grown her profits from uh, 900 to 5,000 US dollars, and she has grown her operation to today having seven employees. The most inspiring thing to me about Xiaomi's story um, is not just that she has built a business, rather it is that she has built an operation to help and empower women. So when a woman joins the bakery today, Xiaomi teaches them not only how to bake, but also how to read and how to write, um, uh, and she teaches them basic financial knowledge. One of the great things about an education is that um, it is a gift that keeps on giving. And um, 
And so when bakers join her operation, Shamin is able to teach them some of the things that she had learned from UPenn, from Michigan, and from UC Irvine off Coursera. And so Shamin tells me that her proudest accomplishment is a young girl that uh, had joined her bakery at the age of 16, who had, um, and because of the financial knowledge that Shamin had gained, she was able to talk through with the 16-year-old girl, uh, Sabina, what would help Sabina build her best possible financial future. They reasoned that the best thing for Sabina would be to stay at the bakery for some short period of time to build up her savings, and after that, for her to take a standardized exam to go back to school, and Sabina has done this, and Shamin counts as her single proudest accomplishment uh, that she has helped Sabina navigate this path. So when I spoke with Shamin um, about three weeks ago, uh, I told her, and she shared with me her story, I told her that I was very inspired by her work and that uh, uh, I would be sharing her story with a few others, which she gave me permission to do. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, Shamin actually gave me a message to pass on whenever I share her story with others. And um, so Shamin told me to say, or she told me to say to you, that um, Shamin says that uh, the women of Bangladesh are very strong. They need only the opportunity to learn, to support, and to empower themselves. And um, I think that's where Coursera's University Partners comes in. So some of you might know the story of how Coursera had gotten started. Um, as a professor at Stanford University, for about a decade, I had been teaching a 400 student a computer science class. It was just under three years ago that the team of four students helped me put my class online and it reached an audience of 100,000 students. To put that number in context, for me to reach a comparable size audience, I would otherwise have had to teach at Stanford for you know, over 250 years. Um, building on the success of this first uh, initial class, um, I invited uh, uh, one of my uh, very good friends, Daphne, to join me on the project, and we wound up taking this enterprise and launching it into Coursera, which today, um, I'm proud to say, partners with top universities around the world, including 14 of the top 25 U.S. universities, uh, many top universities around the world in Asia, Europe, and elsewhere, um, as well as a number of non-university partners to offer free online courses. So in the last maybe two and a half years, three years, we've grown the team from five, uh, so four students and me, to today a company with 102 employees and uh, grown it from a you know, single university, two classes out of Stanford, to today 108 partners offering over um, 500 courses. So the MOVE movement now is slightly under, it's almost three years old, and what I hope to do today is um, give you a sense of maybe the, 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 the road we've come, the road we've tread so far, as well as uh, some of the, spend most, most of the time talking about some of the future trends we see um, going forward in, in developing scalable models of education. Um, so before uh, uh, diving into the body of the presentation, um, I'd like to ask all of you a poll question. So then get a quick sense. Um, uh, I hope you see on your screen now, you know, have you signed up uh, for a MOOC before and if you could Take a second. Maybe I'll you know, take a, a like a pause for 20 seconds to give you time to uh, uh, answer this question. Hit, hit yes or no, and then hit submit, and then we can see we can all see each other's results. So we'll just take another 10 seconds to so get you put in your results. It's five, four, three, two, one. Great. Thank you. Um. Wow, so I'm actually amazed that uh, uh, over uh, almost 60% uh, of you have signed up for a MOOC with uh, I think about half of all attendees responded. I think about, uh, 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 I think uh, there are about uh, 600 of you, uh, uh, over 600 of you on this um, call. So thank you for joining me and for these answers. There'll be a couple other um, poll questions later in this presentation as well. Um, so given that uh, what uh, uh, almost 60% of you have uh, uh, signed up for a MOOC, uh, uh, I'll, I'll very quickly step through what the learner experience is, but um, spend more time talking about the pieces of MOOCs and the trends that maybe fewer of you uh, uh, might have seen so far. So as many of you um, are already aware, when you sign up for a MOOC um, every week, there are maybe a couple hours of lecture videos with a, a variety of innovative lecture video formats. 
um, <clears throat> there are often polls or in video quizzes similar to the one that you just saw in this presentation where in the middle of a presentation learners might be asked to uh, answer a poll question and, and see what others did and um, every week uh, uh, you know most of the courses have uh, uh, auto graded or peer graded um, homework problems ranging from multiple choice to short answer to math to programming exercises we have fairly sophisticated mm -hmm. functionality for um, auto grading programming exercises where we can have students submit code and then we run unit tests uh, against their code to check for correctness um, we can auto grade all sorts of other things such as you know spreadsheets so that's a basic MOOC experience where every week there are lectures homeworks where you, in which you get feedback um, and discussion forum uh, where students can discuss things with yourselves. And one thing that um, uh, I've been maybe very uh, I've been thrilled by is that ever since we launched the first MOOC two and a half years ago, three years ago, um, by partnering with uh, about 100 of the top universities around the world, working with their over 800 professors teaching on Coursera today, we've seen um, amazing pedagogical innovations. So uh, I thought it'd be fun to show you just a few of my favorite examples. One of the early criticisms of MOOCs is that, you know, if it's just video and multiple choice, uh, maybe that's not the best learning experience. That's not the richest experience you can deliver to students. But with technology advancing over the last two years, many courses, not all, but an increasing fraction of courses is delivering very diverse, rich experiences to learners. So a few examples. Um, since this is ACM, I want to uh, have a few more programming examples, but Rice University teaches an amazing intro to programming class. Students can write Python code right there into the web browser, and uh, in, by the end of this class, every student will have implemented for themselves an asteroid-like game like you see on the screen, which they can play in their web browser. So imagine that, where any learner in the world can write a computer game, write Python into a web browser, and Rice University has a simulator, uh, has a, uh, runs your Python code uh, uh, with, with, a, with a piece of software that they develop that runs your web browser, and they can write computer games for themselves. Um, other examples, um, how can you teach a lab class in a MOOC? Georgia Tech, uh, Michael Schlatt at Georgia Tech, has a very innovative course called Your World is Your Lab, in which you use your world, everyday objects, as your own physics lab to run physics experiments. Shown here, he has students throw objects, maybe a basketball, maybe something else, and use their cell phone camera to videotape the trajectory, say, of a basketball, which you can throw at home. And by marking the position of the basketball frame to frame in this video cell phone camera, students can plot and verify for themselves how the laws of physics affect the trajectory of a basketball. And this is an example of the rich experiential activities that you can, you can assign to learners in a MOOC, where you can actually have lab experiments. Doesn't work for everything, but with innovative invent, uh, instructors like this one at Georgia Tech, uh, you can give students surprisingly rich experience, experiences taking the MOOC. One interesting thing about this is that uh, Michael Schlesch has had originally developed this for a MOOC, and he actually found that his on-campus Georgia Tech students preferred this experience of using their cell phone cameras to record themselves throwing things around, they actually preferred this to going into the physical lab at Georgia Tech. And so what was already developed for a MOOC uh, has now been brought back to the Georgia Tech campus to improve on-campus teaching at Georgia Tech as well. Um, one of my friends, Benson Ye, at the uh, National Taiwan University, we opened up a number of APIs to our university partners to let them plug in different components. Benson Ye at National Taiwan University decided to gamify his probability class. He implemented a computer game in which learners can um, have to try to conquer territory on a map, and they do so by either writing problems in probability or by solving problems in probability. Um, I spoke with Benson, and he tells me that uh, the effect of this game was that he has learners all around the world completely obsessed with solving problems and probabilities. They're basically doing this day and night. And this is uh, an example that uh, I think what happens when you open up APIs and unleash the creativity of you know over 800 of the best instructors in the world, of which Ben Seye is just one, but also one of the frankly really fantastic instructors. Um, many of you will know that one of the innovations we've been most proud of is peer grading, in which we can have students submit work and have students grade each other's work. So, uh, so you know, we, we didn't want to offer only multiple choice, but if you have 100,000 students submit 
open-ended work, how do you get them graded? Well, I think the only viable solution we saw was to crowdsource it and have them grade each other's work. So uh, one of the my favorite examples of peer grading was a design class taught by uh, Penn, taught by Wharton, in which students were asked to build a physical artifact, use their cell phone camera to take a picture and upload objects they had built, and then have it be critiqued and graded by other learners. Um, one last example of innovative pedagogy. This is another of my favorite examples. Scott Plows is Wesleyan, teaches a class called Social Psychology. He usually teaches 12 students a year. When he put this class on Coursera, it reached 240,000 students. His final project was a project called the Day of Compassion, in which he invited learners to spend a day living as compassionately as they can, and then to um, write an essay about what, um, uh, uh, to write an essay about uh, their experience in this day and uh, have it be peer graded by other learners. The students also voted to, you know, to award one of these students the Day of Compassion Award, which included an all expensive pay trip to Stanford and so on. Um, the winner of the Day of Compassion Award was Belesh Jin Dao, who had spent her Day of Compassion visiting a uh, local school in a, in a poor part of uh, New Delhi. And um, by speaking with the girls in, in the school, in, in groups of about 400, um, about sexual abuse, about what is appropriate and what's inappropriate sexual touching for young girls, she uncovered many cases of sexual abuse by, um, uh, uh, by uh, relatives, by, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and today, Balesh continues this program and offers free counseling to many of these girls that were victims of sexual abuse. So you think about it. Um, Scott used to teach about 12 students a year. His class reached 240,000 students, of which Balesh Jin Dao is only one. Um, perhaps a particularly amazing student, but Balesh is just one of Scott's 240,000 students. And Balesh herself is having an impact on this community of about 1,600 girls in a, in a poor area in New Delhi. So by putting content online, uh, we are helping, I think, instructors like Scott Plows dramatically amplify the impact on 240,000 learners uh, who in turn have dramatically greater impact, who, who in turn are taking what they're learning and using that to have an impact on the world. So, um, <clears throat> you know, using this range of technologies, um, including uh, uh, the lectures, the uh, auto grading, peer grading, all of these different types of innovative pedagogies, which are only in some of our courses, a small but growing fraction of our courses. Today, our university partners on Coursera offers courses that span many different disciplines, uh, math, science, and so on. Um, on average, the, the courses on Coursera that are most popular tend to be the ones in computer science and business, um, although that's a, that's a trend where um, on average, computer science and business classes are slightly more popular, although the variance within the category is far greater than the variance across the category. And so uh, mm -hmm. our single most popular class is actually the one on social psychology. Uh, Scott Towser's class from Wesley that I mentioned just now. And um, finally, in terms of the uh, learner experience, um, one thing we've found is that, as, as many of you know, mobile is eating the world. And so one of the things I'm quite proud of is that uh, we've released apps on both iOS and Android. Um, and uh, this is helping us to reach learners all around the world as well. To the poorer learners, we discovered especially, um, especially in Asia, but also in the United States, is often the poorest students that have the longest commutes on a, on a bus or on a train, or the poorest learners that have only intermittent network access. If you live in a poor village in rural India or rural China, you might need to travel to a village center in order to get internet access for a few hours. And so um, uh, developing mobile apps was important to us because our mobile apps allow learners to maybe travel to a library or travel to a village center, get internet access for a few hours so that they can download all the videos you know, for the course or for the week so that they can then make better use of their commute time. And so um, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the fact that we're on iOS and Android um, has been an important part of our ability to take the university content and uh, disseminate it very broadly. So um, let me ask you a question. This, this isn't a poll question, but uh, let me just invite you to uh, uh, reflect this for a few moments. Um, look at all the words on this slide. You know, algorithms, AP statistics, fine universities, Android programming, art techniques. Um, what do all of these words have in common? 
right? It's all sorts of words, like history of rock, quantitative finance, you know, teacher professional development. Um, what do all of these words have in common? Right, I, I'm not sure what guesses you have, but I don't know. What, like, what, what does financial markets, gastronomy, how to change the world, intermediate algebra, like what, 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 there's a unifying theme that groups all of these together. What is it? It is that if you type any of these terms into Google, uh, uh, which you can do in an incognito window, you know, the cookies disable or whatever, you will find that um, one of our university partners shows up on the first page of Google results. Um, if you type in financial accounting, it's a fairly generic term, you see an ad, a paid ad on top, and then uh, the first and second links are Wikipedia and Investopedia, and the third link is Penn, or Wharton, University of Pennsylvania schools on Coursera. Um, if you type in songwriting, uh, this is interesting. The first link is a paid link by Berkeley, Berkeley College of Music, uh, and the first free link, the first non-advertising link, is also by the Berkeley College of Music, uh, and is their songwriting course offered on Coursera. Uh, data analysis, you know, Wikipedia is the first link, and uh, uh, Johns Hopkins course on Coursera is the second link, um, and applying to U.S. universities comes out as the very first link. And so I think um, with the volume, with the very high quality of courses that our university partners are posting on Coursera, this is um, uh, uh, SEO for our university partners that is driving tremendous amounts of traffic to the content of our university partners. Um, uh, recently, University of Pennsylvania has a 14% increase in their number of college applications, uh, and this tremendous rise in the uh, number of applications for undergrad admissions at the University of Pennsylvania, their, their, uh, 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 their head of admissions credits some of it, not all of it, but a good fraction of it, to their very successful MOOCs offered on Coursera. Um, <clears throat> by taking the content from our university partners and placing them online, we can take it and uh, uh, take the brands or take the content from universities all around the world and give them a far greater international reach. Um, this is a map of the learners from just one class, Sociology 101, taught by Princeton University. And uh, our learners all around the world is, um, uh, and, and we are seeing universities now able to teach learners all around the world that otherwise would never have access to their content. Um, Here's a second poll question. I'm, I'm actually kind of curious. I'll show you the right answer. I'll, I'll show you our data in, in a second. But uh, you know, the U.S. is the fastest growing country. So if you look at the number of people that signed up last week, say the U.S. would have been the number one country. And, and I'm kind of curious, of, of all of you in the audience, what is your gut feeling about uh, uh, what is the second largest growing country in terms of new user signs up on, 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 on Moves, at least on Coursera? Um, uh, I'm, uh, once you, maybe I'll, I'll take like maybe you know, 20 seconds uh, time from now for you to select your answer. What's your gut feeling about what's the second fastest growing country? Oh, okay, about uh, 200 of the, uh, all right, about half of you have submitted answers so far. I'll wait 10 more seconds for you to submit. Um, yeah, so about, uh, okay, about two thirds of you have submitted answers. Maybe just five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, cool. It's very interesting. I guess uh, uh, many of you thought India and China. Um, and uh, uh, let me show you our data. Um, it turns out that uh, uh, as many of you had guessed, maybe uh, India actually is our second largest country, but uh, uh, China is actually our fastest growing country. Uh, back in last July, we had done some work to improve our distribution in China. You see in, um, on, on the graph, Back in uh, maybe around July, August of 2003, the China curve, you know, took a took a steep rise up, and uh, that's a combination of several things. So we uh, put servers in China, did a bunch of work in China, had a few Chinese university partners join us, and so China is our second fastest growing country. India is currently our second largest country, and uh, uh, I'm very excited about being able to serve this sort of content to uh, uh, developing economies and other countries. Um, I'm actually spending a lot of chi time in China. Uh, the, the, a lot of fascinating things going on, but um, significant education needs, uh, significant internet infrastructure issues, but I think that um, uh, uh, especially with uh, Android devices, especially with an Android app there, I think there's tremendous potential to um, help educate a lot of learners in China and India and elsewhere. Um, because of the very international nature of our audience, 
we have put a lot of work into internationalizing our website. And so uh, we've translated the website into many languages. And so if you visit Coursera today from China, or if your web browser language is set to China, you know, we are, and we really look like a Chinese language website. Um, and uh, this is the translation of the website. We're also working with a number of partners to translate more of the uh, content, the lecture content into other languages, although that's a slower process. Um, and finally, these are the demographics of the learners on Coursera. Um, even though we offer university courses, the majority, about 75% of the learners on Coursera already have a bachelor's degree, and the median age of the learners is 35. Um, and I think that um, the biggest impact of MOOCs today is on continuing adult education. I think the old model of education, where you go to college for four years and then course for the rest of your life, that makes no sense in today's rapidly changing world, and uh, all of us need regular infusions of knowledge in order to stay current. Um, and so I think the convenience of an online course is bringing many working adults back into the education system. I mean, many of us today are, frankly, programming languages that literally did not exist when we were in college. I mean, I don't know. A lot of Coursera does our work in Scala. Uh, I, I have to admit, I'm still not entirely sure if that was a good or a bad decision, but Scala certainly did not exist when I was an undergrad. But fortunately, there's an amazing course on Scala uh, uh, taught by Martin Odersky at e EPFL. And so many Coursera employees learn Scala by taking MOOCs, and we're seeing this uh, uh, especially computing professionals use Coursera in order to stay up to date. Um, and, and mobile, uh, the Android programming class is our single, is our second most popular class uh, uh, on, on Coursera because again, when many of us went to school, you know, mobile uh, devices really were not what they were today. So um, I've talked a lot about the learner experience. Um, one other thing we offer to learners are is uh, is uh, credentials. So um, to leave off this piece, let me share with you just a story of um, one more student, Zach, or Zach stares for. So I spoke of Zach a few months ago. Um, he's 25, single, lives in New York, and uh, about a year ago, um, slightly less than a year ago, at the age of 25, he had found himself stuck in a dead end, stuck in a job working for an investment firm. Uh, in which that, that, that he really was not very interested in. So what do you do if you're single, you know, 25, single, working in a job that you aren't excited about? Zach decided to uh, quit his job and spend the next five months studying, learning, in order to develop the skills and to pivot or to change his career. Um, Zach's background was in theoretical mathematics, and what he did was decide to take his knowledge and to branch into data science. Um, so he took a course from uh, Johns Hopkins on uh, 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 data science, and um, right away he actually ran into problems. Problem set one was done in Python, the programming language Python, and he had never programmed in Python before. So he Googled around, found a lot of web resources, basically taught himself how to program in Python using other free online web resources. And um, he told me he spent 40 hours working on problem set one in order to learn Python so that he could do the first homework, which was... Uh, uh, using data science to analyze tweets. And uh, after 40 hours of work, he submitted homework one, uh, 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 got full marks, and then moved on. And he did problem set two, did problem set three, and he earned his first MOOC credential from Johns Hopkins. Um, and he moved on. He learned about machine learning, took a class on startup engineering, took a number of other courses, and in the end, he wound up completing, I think, about five MOOCs. Um, at the end of this path, at or towards the end of these five months, he then started posting his resume online in order to seek jobs in data science. Um, and again, initially, it wasn't that easy, actually. He, he, he uh, again, you know, unemployed, right? Uh, uh, Zach told me that when he quit his job, he was actually terrified. Terrified was the word he used because in today's high employment, high unemployment climate, living without a paycheck, you know, is, is, is maybe not the safest decision. So, uh, after completing these MOOCs, Zach put his resume on the web, tried to find a new job, and the first few calls to recruiters actually did not go well. Uh, uh, the first few calls to recruiters, the recruiters would talk to him and say, you know, Zach, um, it looks like you have a bachelor's degree in theoretical mathematics, and it looks like you have this fascinating hobby called data science, but we're a serious company, and you want us to offer you a job to do your hobby, and uh, we're not quite sure if we can do that goodbye. And he had a few calls like that, uh, uh, and, and, and it was not easy. But after a while, 
he then got a call from Columbia's Teachers College, and right away it was like a match made in heaven. They saw that he had acquired deep knowledge in data science from these uh, online courses he was taking, and uh, um, uh, they invited him for an interview, uh, for a second interview. The next day, they offered him a job, and uh, he signed. And today, using the knowledge he had learned from MOOCs, um, Zach worked at Columbus Teachers College, where perhaps with a little bit of irony, what he does today is actually use his data science skills in order to analyze student retention data at Columbus Teachers College in order to try to help them improve their practices. Um, when I spoke with Zach it was a couple months ago, I, I asked him how things are going, uh, and he told me that uh, 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 he actually continues to take MOOCs on Coursera, uh, you know, even with his new full-time job. Uh, he made an interesting comment. He said that when he wasn't working and we had the time to take MOOCs full-time, then that was great. You just you know study day and night. Uh, most recently, he has been trying to learn to play the guitar, and he told me that um, Whereas not working and studying was, was great, he found that having a job, having a full-time job, while simultaneously trying to take a very rigorous you know, guitar class online, he said that uh, that ain't going so well. Um, so with the courses that we offer, many uh, we think of Coursera as offering two types of value to learners. First is the learning, the education, the great edu learning experiences that allows you to gain new skills. We offer that for free. That's the mission. The second type of value we offer to learners is the credential, which helps them to find better jobs, uh, helps them apply to, to college, and that creates a very real tangible value for learners. And we capture a little bit of this value by charging a fee for the credential, maybe 50 US dollars uh, uh, plus minus. And when a learner signs up to earn a verified certificate, we uh, do some work. We check their photo ID. We measure their typing rhythm. It turns out we use a keystroke biometric. We use your typing rhythm to try to identify whether it really is you sitting the keyboard submitting the work. Um, every time you submit a piece of work, we also take your photo with your webcam. And on the basis of this, we know that it really is you sitting at the keyboard submitting the work and um, our university partners and us are issuing verified certificates like these, which learners around the world are listing in their resumes and uh, are using to find better employment opportunities. So um, we actually view uh, the issuing of credentials as a, a tactic for improving student retention as well. One of the criticisms of MOOCs is that we have you know, relatively low, maybe five or four or five percent uh, completion rates on average. But it turns out that if two weeks in, if you take a survey of the students and ask them, are you committed to finishing the class? Of those that say yes, about 62% will actually see finish the class all the way through. Uh, it turns out that if you submit one homework, if you submit the first problem set in the class, uh, you have also about a 45% chance of completing a course. Um, and, and, and interestingly, if we look at all the students that say they're highly committed, you know, the students that swear up and down that they're going to do all the homework, finish the class. If on top of that, they sign up for signature track and pay $50, uh, they are even more likely to complete the class with 88% uh, uh, retention rates in, 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 our, in our last survey. And I think it maybe goes to show that if you have a little bit of skin in the game, if you, you know, pay $50 to, and said committed in that way to completing the class, it significantly increases your odds of completing, completing the class as well. Um, I think the low retention rate, the 4 or 5% completion rate of MOOCs is because um, it offers an opportunity for risk-free exploration. Uh, part of it is a UI design issue, which is, on, which is our fault, which we need to change. But part of it is that many students will sign up for a class and uh, not even show up. Well, many students will sign up for a class and do every single, and watch every single lecture. Many students actually watch every single lecture, but don't descend but don't attempt a single homework, and maybe they're getting what they want out of it. And because they are not incurring massive amounts of college debt, mm -hmm. you know, I think the time that learners are spending on a website is actually time well spent. Um, so in terms of student motivation on Coursera, um, let me ask, uh, maybe this is the, the, the final of our poll questions. Um, uh, uh, why don't you, uh, you know, take uh, maybe 20 seconds to answer this. I'm, I'm actually kind of curious. Uh, learners have myriad motivations for taking courses. So uh, what percentage of learners uh, do you think, you know, intends to list their resumes on their CD or resume? Uh, Coursera has run a poll uh, to try to get a sense of this. 
and uh, 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 then and the, one of these is the right is the, the the answer that we got from our poll. So so why don't you take another maybe a, a fifteen seconds to, to to select your gut feeling answer. Um, right, so about a third, about half of you have submitted answers so far. Right. So there are five, four, three, two, one. Great. Thank you. Oh, great. That's that's actually very interesting. Uh, uh, the large majority of you think that learners want to um, uh, list their credential on their resume. Um, our data shows that there was a seventy-six percent, or seventy-seven, seventy-six point six percent of the learners uh, intend to list their uh, uh, verified credential on their resume. And um, it's very interesting that if someone graduated from, say, a, a University of Minnesota, as in the case of Zach Searsbull, they will list their MOOC credentials on their resume. Um, uh, from the, the you know single course they took from Johns Hopkins or, or, or whatever, uh, uh, and what this means is that when one of these learners achieve a success, uh, the success of learners like Zach are now reflected on Johns Hopkins and uh, uh, in the case of Zach as well as other universities, um, in a similar way to how the successes of your university's alumni are reflected on their university. But I think that uh, learners and employers. Are increase, one, one trend we've been seeing is that learners and employers are increasingly taking MOOC credentials seriously. Um, building on that, one of the things we've seen recently is uh, that starting in January, a number of our university partners have announced specializations in which learners can take not just a single course, but can take a sequence of courses, complete a capstone project, and earn a specialization certificate. So uh, Maryland and Vanderbilt are offering a specialization of mobile programming, uh, Android mobile programming. And um, uh, over 200,000 students have signed up for the first course. Uh, 8,000 of them uh, uh, have signed up to earn a verified certificate. And you know, this means that there'll be thousands of learners writing Android apps. And um, many of these apps will be so-so, right? Many of them won't be that good. But the top 1% of these apps will be absolutely amazing. I can promise you that. The top 1% of these thousands of apps. And in fact, Google Play, Google Play has promised to feature the top five of these apps on the Google Play Store. And so if you think about it, these apps will be amazing. I can promise you that many of you, I, or I predict that many of you will end up installing some of these top five Maryland Vanderbilt classes apps on your Android cell phones, if you use an Android cell phone. And the successes of these learners will be reflected back on Maryland and Vanderbilt. Um, and of course, I think <clears throat> by earning specialization certificates, I think students will also be able to earn a more valuable credential uh, that they can use in their resume to find better employment. Um, I want to leave lots of time towards the end for questions, so I might uh, uh, go through the rest of the slides relatively quickly. But uh, very briefly, one of the things I'm super excited teaching these massive open online courses is that with hundreds of thousands of, uh, uh, with tens or hundreds of thousands of learners in each class, we collect massive amounts of data because every student's activity is in the digital realm. We can log everything. And so we uh, share all the data back, uh, uh, being mindful of student privacy with the university partner that had taught the course. And we also have been developing dashboards to um, uh, provide aggregate summaries of the data back to university partners. And so uh, uh, we and our university partners have been running many studies in order to understand student learnings better. Uh, when I speak at different venues, I, I sometimes tell different stories about what we're learning, uh, but uh, uh, I might uh, 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 and, and then maybe on the, uh, uh, in the interest of time, I might uh, just skip that, I guess. So um, just to uh, summarize, I think, uh, where we are and maybe you know, where, where we think the MOOC movement is growing. Um, Coursera, we view ourselves as building up a two-sided marketplace with universities on the one side and learners on the other side. This means that similar to Amazon, which con connects consumers which, similar to Amazon, which connects producers of merchandise with consumers of merchandise, we connect producers of great educational content with consumers of great of that educational content. And what this does for universities is we help universities reach far more audiences, far greater numbers of learners than would otherwise fit on the university campus. And um, just as the successes of a university's alumnus is reflected back on a university. In the future, I think many universities will be serving 
millions of learners, and the successors of these learners, ranging from Shemesh, uh, ranging from Shamin in Bangladesh to Balesh Jindal in her Day of Compassion, uh, uh, thanks to the uh, Wesleyan class, or to Zach taking data science from uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, or to Shamin learning about economics from UC Irvine and Penn and Michigan. The successes of these millions of learners will be reflected back on the universities that have helped them create these successes. Um, just to finish up the Coursera story, uh, so far I've been talking about MOOCs and our ability to reach these tens or hundreds of thousands of learners around the world. There's a second thing that Coursera does, which I think of as incredibly important as well. So some of you will know my uh, co-founder at Coursera, Daphne. Um, in the early days, Daphne and I used to have these, uh, the, frankly now I realize, somewhat silly debates in which I was very focused on putting online content for free to the whole world. And she had a different emphasis on developing online content to serve Stanford University students, where she and I have been professors for a long time. Um, and so uh, uh, my co-founder, Daphne, had been a real pioneer on um, the pedagogy of flipped classroom, in which rather than using classroom time to lecture you know, a group of, say, 50 students attending a Stanford class, uh, she had the idea that we should put lecture content on the website so that this small group, but important group of say 50 Stanford students can watch the videos at home and come into the classroom and have the classroom time be reserved for discussion uh, because they've already watched the lectures at home. Um, this type of pedagogy is called the flipped classroom and it is significantly improving the educational experience on on uh, on the campuses of many of our university partners as well. Um, and so. In the early days, actually, Daphne and I used to have these silly debates about which of the two we should do. I always said, we should put free online content and focus on educating the world. And she said, no, our first duty is to serve Stanford students because we're Stanford professors. And um, uh, uh, this debate continues at some university campuses. But what we realized was that it was silly to have this debate, and we should create online educational content once and use it for both purposes. And so a second uh, uh, important activity of Coursera is that we work with our university partners to help them implement the flipped classroom to hopefully imp help them improve the quality of their on-campus education as well. And uh, this is another maybe piece of value that we develop, uh, uh, hope to uh, bring to the campuses of our university partners to help our university partners improve the quality of on-campus education. Finally, just to wrap up, <clears throat> um, you know, Three years ago, two and a half years ago, there was a, this project was a team of five of us, um, uh, four students, you know, like, uh, and uh, I've been thrilled and surprised at how rapidly um, the MOVE movement has, has grown. And it was when the five of us had put these courses online that we started running around talking about this idea that perhaps education shouldn't be only for the elite, um, uh, that the great education shouldn't be only for the privileged, but a great education should be a fundamental human right. And um, I think that with technology, with the internet technology that all of us work on, the, with, with, with technology that all of us work on, um, I think we can dramatically enhance the reach of universities all around the world. Um, and I think that the idea of universal access, I think the idea of universal access is no longer some utopian ideal. Rather, I think it is something that we can actually realize. And with that, um, let me say thank you all very much. All right, thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, this is Marty Hurst again, and I've organized about 50 questions into about 10 categories, including questions about traditional education, software and open source, peer grading, pedagogy or teaching, uh, the future of MOOCs, uh, MOOCs in the developing world, completion rates, and business questions. So let me start with just, uh, let's talk about the relationship to traditional education. And I'll read a few of the questions, and I'll let you answer them in a group. Uh, one question is, it can be argued that MOOCs will lead to massive job cuts at educational institutions. Uh, would you hire a tenured professor if you could simply license a MOOC and hire a few TAs? Does this worry you? Uh, another related question, do you see MOOCs uh, retiring traditional education? Uh, and uh, a different angle on this is um, how different are the courses in Coursera in comparison to the courses you lecture on in Stanford? For example, I suppose the machine learning course in Stanford is far more difficult than the one in Coursera. Yeah, 
Uh, yep, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, questions. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mikhail Vajek, uh, 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 Vejan Karasik, uh, David Sherman, and many others asking questions on this. Um, so, you know, to, to ask the question is most doc, uh, will MOOCs replace professors, right? Uh, and, and to answer that, um, let me invite, let me actually ask all of you uh, listening in on this to think about your favorite professor. You know, think about your favorite teacher. And uh, think about the conversations that you had with your favorite mentor, your favorite teacher. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and think about how you feel towards him or her even today. And now let me ask, that favorite teacher of yours, do you think we can replace him or her with a computer? I think the answer is obviously no, uh, and we'd be silly to even try. The reality, though, is that today that favorite teacher of yours is spending most of his or her time delivering the same lecture year after year. Um, that favorite teacher of yours is spending most of his or her time grading homework. And I think the opportunity for technology is not to replace them, which I think would be terrible. I think the opportunity for technology is to free them up from these more routine aspects of teaching uh, so that they can have much more time to spend in conversation with future students, same, same, as, same as they did with you. So what I think MOOCs does is it um, uh, can, uh, uh, can uh, automate the more routine parts of teaching so that instructors can move up the value chain to provide even more high level uh, valuable services to students, such as encouraging, such as encouragement, mentoring, getting students involved in research. Um, I hope that, so I hope in developing economies this will make teachers even more valuable. In developing economies, such as India and to a lesser extent China, teachers are not to be found for any price. There are, you know, villages in India where no matter how wealthy you are, the, the teacher just doesn't exist. For those places, um, I think there is no choice but to, uh, uh, you know, try to have local, maybe less skilled mentors together with online content. Uh, uh, but I think that uh, uh, where possible, I, I would hate for a MOOC to come between a student and their teacher. All right. Uh, uh, Marty, so there's do you want a number to of one? Yes, there's a number of questions about software and open source, and I'd like to read several of them because they're a little different and they're quite interesting. Is your platform open enough to allow developers to write mobile apps for other platforms? Uh, that's a question pertaining to, to Coursera and another one about Coursera. Does Coursera follow any standards for integrating course content? Uh, then uh, there's a couple of questions about uh, synchronous versus asynchronous delivery, uh, and that, which is another uh, interesting aspect about MOOCs are primarily asynchronous today. Uh, will Coursera yeah. ever consider putting its technology into open source? Another question like that. And um, also, uh -huh. do STEM, uh, which is uh, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics MOOCs, play a role in engaging more people in open source development? And is the software to implement interactive programming in a browser available as open source? I think the software that you referred to. Um, sure, great. Yep, thank you. Uh, Paco Vidal, Rob Fay, uh, Gordon Everest, uh, others for these questions. Um, let's see, uh, uh, is our platform open? Uh, boy, to, to, to try to take some of these really quickly. Yes, we do support the uh, LTI standard. Many of our university partners use the LTI standard to integrate their own uh, quizzes and so on into our platform. Um, uh, the Coursera platform is not currently open source, but uh, what we try to do is open up APIs to make it efficient for our university partners to take their ideas and scale it. Uh, um, Let's see, uh, uh, is it open enough to allow developers to write mobile apps or other platforms? Um, we currently have apps on iOS and Android. We're interested uh, uh, in you know, trying to support as many platforms as seems uh, reasonable. Uh, we are slowly opening up more and more APIs. So for example, we've uh, opened up uh, uh, a uh, catalog API so that to make our courses more discoverable. Um, we are very interested in opening up you know, a number of APIs. Uh, uh, I'm not quite sure. Um, how much of the APIs we will open. Part of the issue is that all of the content on Coursera is owned by the university partners, not by us. Um, and so we need permission from them if we are to serve their API, if to serve their content out via different channels. So we're very interested in making the content more broadly available. All, all the content we offer for free anyway. Um, asynchronous versus asynchronous delivery. You know, when we offered the first MOOCs in 2011, I think there was this big event, right? But uh, when we talk to learners, um, when I travel, actually, I often go to student meetups. So when, actually, when, when I travel, I often go to meetup.com slash Coursera and find a local group of students and actually like sit with them for an hour and two to, to find out what's going on. The number one feature request I get when I go to those meetups is for more flexible timelines because we're serving mainly 
uh, adult professionals that often have a job, have you know rigorous demands on their time, and so uh, we're toying with the idea of um, uh, uh, more flexible deadlines. Um, all our content is asynchronous in the sense that there are weekly deadlines, but you can do it any day in the week. Uh, we have learners in every single time zone, so we tend to have weekly deadlines, but you can take the course any time during that week, but we are uh, toying around, experimenting with whether we can have maybe on-demand content. I don't know if that makes sense at all, actually, or uh, uh, just more flexible deadlines. So these are some of the things we're um, thinking through. Um, it's not for inter uh, 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 yeah, it's, it, uh, and I think uh, more broadly, I think, uh, 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 let's see, oh, do STEMs play a role in engaging more people in uh, open source development? Um, it's true that uh, our computer science instructors have been, um, have maybe more of the skills needed to implement the really rich creative, uh, uh, you know, modules and plugins uh, that they implement on our website. Uh, on average, although we're certainly seeing, you know, humanities, statistics, uh, business instructors uh, have very, very innovative pedagogies, although it is true that computer science professors have been much more likely on average to write new software to plug into Coursera than non-computer science professors. All right, let's move on. We only have four and a half minutes left. There were several questions about peer grading, including could you talk about how peer graded assignments work? Uh, do you have uh, multiple people grade the same assignment to get a more accurate grade. Does it work better in some courses than others? Are there rules on how to manage the quality? I've seen some criticisms about it. Uh, I've noticed the quality of the feedback varies greatly in courses that I've taken. And is the Coursera signature track impacting the effectiveness of peer grading? Yeah, yeah great, thank you. Uh, so let's see. Uh, uh, here's how peer grading works. Um, as a learner, it's a Rohan Katerius question, how does peer grading work? Um, as soon as one of these classes, you'll be first asked to submit the work. After you've submitted the work, we then train you to how to grade other students' work. We then also ask you to grade a few pieces of work that the instructors also graded to demonstrate that you can assign reasonably accurate grades. And then finally, every student is required to grade some number of other homeworks, maybe five or six or seven. Uh, uh, and then in exchange, every student gets feedback from you know some number of students uh, about the quality of their own work. And then finally, we take the median or the average, usually the median of all the grades that other learners assign to you as your final grade. Um, so you know, I, I would give ourselves a, a maybe a B in terms of how well well there is variability in how well peer grading works. In some studies done in some classes, it gave very accurate grades. In other classes, the feedback has been more problematic. Uh, some of the problems that, that we're aware of that we need to fix. One is uh, non-English speakers uh, um, have trouble giving meaningful feedback. Uh, in cases where we fail to work with the instructors to give good rubrics, the quality of peer grading was a little bit variable. There have been some problems in peer grading. It is very much on our radar to fix. I, I would give ourselves maybe a B right now in terms of the quality of our peer grading. Um, is working very well in, peer in, in, in many classes, but there is still work to be done in it. We have some experimental technology. It turns out that um, because we have all this data, we know which are the reliable graders and which are the unreliable graders. We know also if a student consistently grades too high or too low. And so uh, we, we, we in, in, in technology, we've piloted but not rolled out. It turns out that um, if we discover that one student consistently gives uh, if we find that you were unlucky and got five really tough graders that all consistently give lower grades, we can make a mathematical adjustment to your grade to bump it up. Uh, and and in, in uh, internal prototyping not rolled out, you know, we find that this actually gives uh, uh, significantly more accurate grades if we make these corrections. So we're working on a few things uh, uh, to try to improve peer grading. All right, I think we have time for one more group of questions. I'm really sorry, everyone, because there's even more pouring in. Uh, I think. For this group, we'll go for the business questions. Uh, there are several related ones. What's the business model which allows Coursera to employ over 100 staff who's sponsoring this? What's the average cost of developing a MOOC for business? How does it financially sustain itself? And I think that the most creative one here, if Coursera could be started again, what would have been done in a different way? Or what would have been the best possible way? Oh, cool. Thank you. Oh, great questions. Um, so let's see, business model for Coursera. Uh, we offer for free to universities the tools, techniques, and uh, best practices and support to help universities create online content. The university bears the cost of content production, which is then hosted on Coursera, and we serve it to learners around the world. 
uh, for free. If a student signs up for a signature track to try to earn a verified certificate, we charge a fee for that. And the fee for the verified certificate is shared between the university that had produced the content and Coursera to try to keep both um, uh, both the university content production and Coursera's enterprise sustainable. Coursera is not yet break even. Uh, right now, we're spending more cash than we are bringing in in revenues. Uh, universities uh, report maybe around fifty thousand US dollars. It's maybe typical as the cost of producing a MOOC. Uh, we are confident that uh, with improvements to the site, with increased conversion rates to, to paid and so on, that we will uh, uh, be able to cover, we hope, to cover the content production costs for most of the courses that our university partners are offering. Uh, maybe one data point. Over the past year, you know, in, in, in the first year since we launched the Verify Certificates program, we, by optimizing the website and a few other things, we've doubled the rate of conversions um, of, of paid, you know, unpaid to paid signature track. Um, because of the mission, I really, my mission, our mission is to give everyone a great education. We also offer financial aid. If there's a student that cannot afford 50 US dollars, you know, we, give, we ask them to fill out a one page financial aid application and we give, them, give it to them for free. I've been told many times that this makes no sense for a business to worry about financial aid to people with no money. But speaking as an educator, uh, I feel strongly that no matter how lucrative something is, if we can't help the neediest and the most vulnerable in our society, I'm just not that interested, which is why uh, it wasn't even controversial, actually. Offering financial aid was just something that was so obvious to all of us around the table that we needed to do. Um, so we still have some ways to go in order to make Coursera financially sustainable. Right now, we, we have raised 85 million US dollars from uh, five of your university partners, as well as some uh, uh, venture capitalists that are investors in Coursera. We still have some road ahead of us to turn this into financial, a financially sustainable business, but all the trends are looking very positive, and so I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. Um, finally, if Coursera could be stopped again, what could everything have been done? Uh, you know, there are a couple things I wish I had done differently. Um, uh, realizing the content should be much more modular. Uh, instead of 10-week courses, we really should be teaching four-week courses or maybe six-week courses. That's one. Um, I think uh, 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 really misdesigned the discussion forum. Uh, a long story around that. We looked at Stack Overflow for inspiration. Stack Overflow is great at giving the definitive answer to one question. That design with voting up and down questions isn't the best one for uh, developing a community and having learners get to know each other. I think I, and I, I, that was my responsibility, actually. It was my call. I made a bad decision on that. Uh, 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 and uh, I think that, uh, um, I don't know, and I think that uh, it's, it's still not clear to me if content should be synchronous or asynchronous. I'm very interested. I, I really wonder if the deadline was really a good idea. It serves some useful purposes, but uh, uh, I, I wonder if we made a mistake there as well. But these are some of the things. Uh, but I would definitely have made courses much shorter, much more modular. Um, I'm realizing that learning is much more about what the student does, more so than what the professor does. Uh, so a lot of these are maybe two or three or four of the things that uh, uh, we would have redone uh, differently if we could have uh, gone back uh, three or four years. Um, Great. We're running All right. very late. Uh, let me just say thank All you. Right. We got oh, it. Yes, Marty. We've got to end. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, thanks to everyone for listening. This webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org slash webinar. You can find announcements on upcoming webinars and other activities at learning.acm.org. Also, please fill out our quick survey online. Uh, you can see the link where you can suggest future to topics or speakers. This is Marty Hurst saying thanks again for joining us. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.